Hello and welcome again to my channel where I seek to provide you Oracle related content for your personal and professional development. And certainly if you like content like this, if you've been a fan of this channel, please go ahead, uh, subscribe, uh, like the videos and share with your friends. So uh, today we are going to be talking about role lock contention. And if you have been a DBA for any considerable length of time, you must have received a call or ticket about your database hanging. Now, as DBAs, we are the most, uh, quote unquote, hated, uh, but most important folks on the IT side of the company. And that is because uh, when there is any problem, um, they usually come to the DBA uh, to resolve it. Now, do you understand how locks impact database performance? Have you resolved a situation where an application user calls or raises a ticket that says uh, their transaction is hung. And um, if you have done any of that, then you're certainly familiar with the role lock contention concept. Otherwise, in this session, I want to refresh your memory or introduce you to the concept of locks within the Oracle database environment. So during this review, what do we plan on doing? I will talk about the following concepts. So first of all, I will talk about uh, something called consistency and concurrency. Consistency and concurrency. I will also talk about, um, so uh, in terms of locking, uh, I would also talk about uh, the modes of locking. And basically there are two types. So we would talk about the exclusive uh, locks, and uh, we would talk about shared locks as well. So these are the two basic modes of locking. So let's go ahead and put this in parentheses. All right. And then we would also talk about what we call the NQ uh, mechanism. So this is a mechanism that exists within Oracle that helps you control uh, locks. And most of all, uh, I would present to you a demo on a use case scenario where you know we would demonstrate some of the understanding of some things that we um, will be talking about. So hopefully by the end of this video, uh, what do I desire to help you resolve? Uh, by the end of this video, um, I would probably uh, have helped you understand and how to resolve role lock contentions within the Oracle database understand more about the NQ mechanism and the transaction role lock contention, uh, help you understand a little bit about the database role lock contention, um, Oracle NQ mechanisms, and of course, um, showing you how to detect uh, locks within the Oracle database using SQL. So um, what are locks? So let's go ahead and talk about locks then. So what are locks? Um, typically, um, we can't just talk about locks, you know, without going into a very lengthy conversation uh, about, you know, some certain details, but I'm going to try to keep it short in this video, I promise you. So to put it simply, locks are used by Oracle databases to provide data concurrency and integrity between transactions, right? So first of all, uh, locks are used, there are the concept, like I mentioned earlier, consistency and concurrency. Uh, so locks are used to provide that level of concurrency and integrity between transactions. Locking within an Oracle database is also an entirely automated process uh, that prevents destructive interaction between transactions accessing the same resource at the same time. So uh, there are several levels to locking but the Oracle database automatically uses the lowest applicable level of restrictiveness uh, to provide the highest degree of data concurrency, yet also providing a fail-safe data integrity solution. So what does this all really mean? What this all really means, um, let's start off with some of the primary concepts, like I mentioned before, consistency and concurrency. So this consistency and concurrency, let's talk about this for a little bit. So consistency simply just means that uh, each order, uh, for many of the people who are logged into a database, uh, each order 
each other user that is logged into the database sees a consistent view of the same data that is within the database. So that is consistency. So they see a consistent data. Now, concurrency, on the other hand, means that users can access data at the same time, concurrent users. We are in there concurrently at the same time. And while quite concurrency means they all can be in there at the same time, consistency certainly means that uh, while they are in there, there is only a consistent set of data that they can see, including visible changes made by the user's own transactions and, of course, the transactions of some of the other users that are also working on the database. So as DBAs, we need to have a good understanding of what happens when transactions are issued within the database. So let's talk about transactions first. So uh, let's talk about transactions, right? So within a database, uh, when we talk about transactions within a database, what do we typically mean? Um, a transaction, of course, you're familiar with um, 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 DML statements, DDL statements, uh, transaction control statements, and things like that. And as you all know, a transaction is simply just a logical atomic unit of work that contains one or more SQL statements. Now, if I have to expand on this a little bit, a transaction groups SQL statements so that they are either all committed, which by that means the changes are applied permanently or are rolled back, which by that I mean, you know, the changes are undone, right? Now, an Oracle database assigns every transaction a unique identifier such as uh, called a transaction ID. So each transaction has a transaction ID. And like I mentioned earlier, that transaction can either be a DDL, which is a data definition language, or a DML, which is um, a data manipulation language. So, so DDL, um, data definition language, while the DML is data manipulation language. Which, so um, I do have a video where I did an intro into um, SQL statements. I can attach that in the link uh, uh, below the video so that you can use that also for a reference. Now, when we talk about DMLs and DDLs, uh, we, when you issue a DML, a DDL to a database, uh, there is something we call implicit commit. So by the time that DDL executes, uh, the changes become already permanent. It is a data definition language. So we're talking here about create, alter, delete, uh, drop, anna, and truncate. Each time each of these transactions completes, there is an implicit commit, which means the changes that are made as a result of that DDL transaction are committed. In terms of data manipulation, right here, we're talking about select, insert, update, delete. Um, when we talk about this, uh, we would refer to the end of a transaction, a DML transaction, we would say it ends after, an, after a commit or a rollback. So if you issue an update statement, if you issue a delete statement on a roll, if you issue uh, an insert statement on a roll, it only becomes permanent after a commit. Now, um, you could either commit or you could roll back. So a transaction will end if you issue a commit, a transaction will end if you issue a rollback. Now, other situations where a transaction will typically end is if a user exits his session gracefully, by that I mean the exit, right? And when the, upon exit, any transactions that have not been committed will become committed at that point. Now, if for some reason we have um, an abnormal termination of that session, say maybe um, a shutdown, a power outage, or the database kind of shuts down, you know, um, then committed transactions will become permanent while uh, uncommitted transactions will be rolled back. So um, only during those scenarios would you consider that, you know, a transaction is, has ended. All right, now to ensure consistency and concurrency, there is something we call the ACID model. And if you have been a DBA or you're familiar with SQL, you certainly would have heard a little bit about this concept. So the ACID model, the A stands for, uh, it has four key, um, four key properties. 
So um, the ACID model basically is just an acronym. ACID stands for an acronym, right? And within that acronym, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger here since I'm running out of space here. All right, so um, the A, would stand for, let me see if I can move this up here. Um, this is Windows 11. I'm not super used to Windows 11. So uh, we would just try to see what we can do about it. Atom atomicity, um, the C stands for uh, consistency. The I stands for isolation and the D stands for durability. And I will explain this here shortly. So, uh, but before I explain that, again, like I mentioned, um, these four properties represent a set of database design principles that emphasize aspects of reliability that are important for business data and mission critical applications. So it is a best practice um, to implement the ACID model in terms of you know, designing your database principles. Now, atomicity, it means that the entire sequence of actions that within a transaction must be either completed or aborted. There is no partial transaction. You cannot run an update statement and it updates some and doesn't update some and then runs to completion. No, it either updates everything or it doesn't. So it either, it either goes to completion or it aborts. And if it completes, then you can commit. If it aborts, then it rolls, rolls back. The idea of consistency is when a transaction takes the resources from one consistent state to another consistent state. So that is all called consistency. And we mentioned the concept of consistency above, uh, where the, uh, concurrent users who are logged into a database must see a consistent image of that data that's present. The concept of isolation simply means a transaction's effect is not visible to other transactions until that transaction is committed, it's completed. Now, the database would serialize, of course, concurrent access to data. And that is a whole concept of the role locking mechanism, which where we would talk about the NQ mechanism. Now, durability just simply means, of course, when you commit a transaction, you make it permanent. So changes made by any committed transactions become permanent. And the durability aspect of it is that it survives, of course, database restarts or system failures. So these four properties, like I mentioned earlier, are cardinal uh, to uh, the transactions within um, a database environment. So uh, Oracle uses what we call an NQ mechanism. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. So uh, let's talk about the NQ mechanism. So this is the part where all right, let's talk about NQ mechanism. So this is kind of an automated, you know, um, operation within the database, right? It is a sophisticated locking mechanism that permits several level of concurrent processes to share known resources to various degrees. NQs coordinate the parallel access to Oracle resources such as objects or data records. So, this is particularly important because when multiple transactions need to lock the same resource, the first transaction that acquires a lock on that resource holds that lock until it is done completing what it needs to do. So this NQ mechanism is automatic. So, so the, as a DBA, we don't have any access or control over that mechanism. The database assigns the lock to whichever transaction is next in queue after the one that holds the lock completes. And there are different levels of locking, which can either be automatic or manual. You can use the DBMS packages uh, to, to kind of lock manually. So let's go ahead, I think, and we can do a little demo. And I think in that demo, we should be able to kind of see how some of these things really do work. So for that demo, uh, I'm going to open up a party, uh, a party session here. Um, let me open up my mobile XM. Um, and you know what, let me just open up party sessions, actually. I'm going to open up a party session um, and connect to my one of my um, let me use this one. So I'm going to use one of my RAG databases here. I'm just gonna copy all of this. I'm gonna use party sessions because I'm gonna be using multiple sessions here so that you guys see the effect of these locks in action. So let's go ahead and open that session. Um, the password is Oracle. All right, I'm gonna make this a little bit, um, 
change the settings here to make it a little bit more readable for everybody. I'm gonna use 12, make it bold. And I'm gonna apply that. And I am going also to create a duplicate session from this. So, so let's do this. Uh, let's do, let me put one to one side and then I put this one to this side. All right, I don't know if this is visible enough for you. Uh, let me just make that 14, just to make sure <clears throat> everybody is able to see. Let's do that. Okay, good. That looks to me like it's a lot better. I'm just gonna go ahead and exit out of this and then I duplicate this session. Uh, sorry for... Okay, good. So let me put that to one side here. And then I make sure that this one comes up on this side as well. So I have, you know, two sessions here of my Miyaka one. So um, I would open up one of my databases and I would set the same environment here. Okay, and then I would, of course, head on into that database. Of course, um, it is a 12 release two database. So in order for us to simulate our locking sessions, I want to talk about DML locks, right? Uh, DML locks are one type of locks, right? And DML statements, which I mean, by that I mean insert, update, delete, and uh, a special case of select uh, statements when you issue a select for update uh, that takes a DML lock on that role that you want to work on. So it's a role. So DML statements can acquire both table logs and role level logs. But in our demo, we are going to be working with role level logs. So I would use a user here that we are all familiar with. If you have those example schemas in your database, uh, let's uh, do a column name. Uh, no, let's go, let's connect first of all to HR. And then hopefully uh, the password is HR. Um, and I would connect here to HR with the password HR. Connect HR, password HR. Okay, so if I do a show user, so I am HR on this side and I do a show user, I am HR on this side. So let's first of all, take a look at um, what HR has as tables. So I would run a select uh, table name from user underscore tables. And that would give me what HR has in terms of tables. So let's look at that. Um, we don't need to run that on this side because it's going to be the same thing. So, um, so HR has eight tables, regions, countries, uh, locations, departments, jobs, employees, job history, employee, dope. So um, um, let me see what amount of uh, tables do we have in each, uh, what amount, what number of rows of data do we have for each of these tables? So I would issue a column table name. Uh, let's do table name here. Uh, and then I do a format for that table name. I would give it maybe, uh, let's see, maybe 20, you know, characters. So I would select, of course, table name. And then I want to count the number of rows. So num rows from all underscore tables where owner equals HR. Hopefully that SQL statement runs correctly. So if you look at the number of rows for each of these tables, uh, regions has four. So let's work with the regions table since it's got a little bit of a, a, a smaller set of characters that we can work with. So um, select star from regions. Let's just see what we have in regions, okay? So these are two sessions for HR open, right? So uh, I would use these two concurrent sessions just to show you um, a little bit of a demo how you know, uh, we can, you know, do a locking in this scenario. So uh, let's clear, let's clear this um, so that we can see host clear. Uh, we can just type host clear. So that kind of cleans it up. So host clear. So we have two different sessions. Again, I will do a show user just so that we kind of recap where we are. And user of course is HR. So what I want to do is I want to see what the session uh, ID is for this user. So I can select uh, sys, let me, I like using, when I'm doing demos, I like using capital letters. So let's select uh, sys context. 
sys uh, context um, for the user environment, user env, user env, and the seed. <clears throat> I want to see the seed for that particular session. Um, so it says I must have spelled something wrong. So select sys context. So user env, sys context, user env. That is where I have a problem. User env, seed. And then we see here. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy that and and and, and certainly uh, let's see if I can select um, sys context. So let's do that. Oh, I was selecting that and I wasn't selecting it from dual. So let's do that again and see. So select sys context. Forgive me for from the table called dual. So that gives me an SID of 409. So let's do the same for, for this other session. And that session is 276. The reason I'm asking for two sessions is certainly because you would see what happens when I try to lock, use one session to lock the other one. So, so let's go ahead and acquire a lock on the regions table. So for me to be able to do that, I would use a special case of select for update. And you can use, you can lock anything. Uh, you, could, you, could, you could go ahead and issue a, a delete, uh, 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 an update um, on any of the columns on any of the rules and you don't commit yet, it would still put it in a lock state. So, but here I don't wanna make any uh, major change. So I'm just gonna do a select maybe star from uh, regions and I use a where clause where region ID. And if you don't know where I know about regions, so let me just make sure that I describe regions here. Uh, let's describe regions so that you know exactly what I am working with. So. And I will run a select star again from regions. That way you know what I'm looking at. So assuming that I wanted to make a change to the region ID, um, instead of Middle East and Africa, I want to put Middle East and maybe insert in my mind another region ID five and call Africa. So imagine that I want to make a change to this, okay? So let's go ahead and do select star from regions where uh, region, ID equals four for update. So let's use that statement. So basically I told you guys in the beginning that when you run a select for update, it acquires a DML lock on this row. So this row has been locked by this session. So let's go ahead and try to see on this other session where I, if I can make a change on that row. So, um, so if I, issue an update regions, set uh, region name equals, uh, let's give it a name, um, uh, let's just say Middle East, right? Let's just say Middle East here because then in my mind, I'm thinking I would keep Middle East over there and then insert another column to, to say uh, Africa, right? Uh, so, so set region name, Middle East, where region, and you know, I mean, if you're not familiar with, you know, um, the syntax for these DML statements, like I mentioned, I have a video, I'm gonna put the link in the description below. So where region equals four. Now, because this session already acquired a lock on this row, anything I try to do on this row is supposed to wait. So if I hit enter, now it's hanging. And this is the part where a lot of those application developers that love DBAs so much would call and say, hey, I'm running a SQL and it's hanging. And you as a DBA, and this is that use case scenario, you would have to figure out exactly what is causing my database to hang. And you start looking around. And the first thing I usually go when a session is hanging is to see if there are any blocking sessions. So um, now I know I have simulated, I have forced a blocking session in here. And I am going to go and open up uh, um, a different terminal, log in as an elevated user, as a DBA, someone who has administrative uh, authority over the database, and then try to see now if I can figure out who 
is locking what? So uh, let me go to my prim one. And again, if you have Oracle Enterprise Manager, the scenario is pretty simple. You go under performance, you go under sessions, you're gonna see you know, uh, blocking sessions, it's gonna be right there written for you. But I prefer using the command line. Maybe some of you do also prefer using the command line like I do. Um, so let's go ahead then and use the command line. So let's go into our database. So show user, I'm an elevated privileged user. I logged into the database assist and um, I would run one of two queries. I would give you guys all the queries. Um, so the first query I would run would be this one um, where I would select the SID serial number username from V$ sessions and I would pick that back into uh, a blocking session select statement from V$ session. So um, that is the statement right there. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Uh, let me control you and then uh, let's do that. Uh, this is not okay. So let's do this again. So let's go here. So select SID serial number username from V$ session where SID is in. Select blocking session from V$ session. So it tells me here that there is a blocking session and that person who is responsible for blocking is this. Now, the second SQL I want to share with you is one of my favorites because it tells you exactly who is blocking who, all right? So uh, this second select statement um, is, uh, if you give me a second here, I should be able to pull that up uh, right here. Okay. Give me one second. I'm just kind of editing it. I should have done that before. Um, so let's do, um, I'm gonna do that one here. Um, it's a little bit on the long side. You can pause the video to make sure that you, you know, you copy this correctly. So, um, and that, and then I would use a where clause. I would use a where clause. And L1, L2 request. Again, we didn't go into so much detail. I should have been able to explain to you the L1 and L2, uh, but we don't have much time on this video. This is supposed to be a quick demo. And let's see if this statement works and then you would see what I'm talking about. So when this statement runs, it tells you the blocking status, right? It tells you HR, at miaka1.local domain with an SID of 409 is blocking HR. And this is why, now you guys see why I like this, this, this SQL, because then it tells you exactly who is blocking who. So the SID 409 is blocking the SID 207. Okay, now I know then that I have a blocking scenario, right? Now, the second part of this for me now would be certainly to, uh, use another SQL to find out the serial number of that SID. So let me go ahead and find the serial number of that SID. So SID in, I would use this in that and that, right? Um, and then um, order by, I wouldn't even use the order by C. So Let's go ahead and run that query. So it tells me here that there is, there are two HR sessions, right? Um, two SIDs, and then they have different serial numbers. Now, why do I need the serial numbers? Um, because I would have to kill one of the sessions. Now that would be the last option. Killing a session would be the last option. And as a DBA, you certainly don't wanna do that until that is your only option. And the reason I say that is because sometimes applications run batch jobs that take a long time to complete. And not that I'm you know, picking on any application developers or people who write and create those SQL scripts. Uh, if you have a SQL script that is doing updates or, or DML on millions of roles without commits at intervals, uh, there are some, is going to be some performance repercussions, right? And that's why those batch jobs are typically run at times when there is not much of database activity. So uh, if I find out who the user is within the database, I certainly can find out within the organization who that user is, because of course there is a naming convention typically, 
uh, when we create users. If it is an application, you, if it is an application schema doing those updates, then I have a contact person on the application side that I can say, hey, there is a certain job running with this SID and this username. Um, could you identify who that person is or who that job is? And what should we do about it? Would you want me to kill it? Would you want me to, to let it run onto completion? It's holding up, there are performance issues, users cannot you know, uh, do what they need to do, but you have to have that level of communication. Otherwise, you're gonna kill a session about something um, that is going to be potentially uh, fatal for business continuity. Imagine doing that when we have batch jobs that are running payroll. Um, that's not gonna be a good thing, right? So um, if in the event, and in my scenario, of course, um, I don't have anything important running, so I can go ahead and do what I need to do here. So um, I want you guys to take a look at this. So I minimize this screen because I want you guys to take a look at something. So the moment I kill that session, uh, that session that had been hanging, which is this one, which is hanging, it is going to run to completion, right? So this I have to kill using the alter, alter system kill session command. Now, again, I always specify as DBS, please, please, please use this command carefully. So which session am I willing to kill? So I realize here, like I mentioned earlier, if you looked at this, it says here that the session on the session with session ID 409 is the blocker, right? So I want to kill the blocker and let the other session run. So 409 has a serial number of 62326. Uh, so let's go ahead and kill that session and we kill it using the word immediate. So if we don't use the word immediate, then it's gonna, I mean, you're certainly familiar with database, you know, shutdown modes, right? It's gonna try to finish up the transaction before getting killed. We don't want that. We wanna kill it immediately so that other transactions can, can execute. So I want you guys to take a look at what happens on this side. As I hit enter here, that session gets killed. And then of course the role that was locked got released and this guy who was next in line, according to that NQ mechanism, now acquires the lock on that role and transactions now continue to flow. So this is a very quick scenario, guys, that I prepared for you to show you and display to you the concept of locks blocking uh, within the Oracle database. Certainly, um, there is another concept called the Oracle deadlock. We would save that for another, vi for another video, uh, but by now, like I mentioned earlier in the beginning, um, I hope you have been able to understand how to resolve Oracle role of contention within databases, understanding more about the NQ mechanism and how it translates to transaction role lock contention. Certainly understand database role lock contention in a very simple demonstration. Uh, Oracle NQ mechanism and detecting, of course, Oracle locks with SQL uh within this using sql statements of course like i mentioned you could use oracle enterprise manager so i hope this video was informative for you and i do hope that uh you're finding value in watching this if you did uh please go ahead and smash that like button uh don't forget to subscribe to the channel um share let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below thank you all for watching and i would see you in the next video